Right. I don't I don't get the reference. Uh, you're older than you ever were. Yes. And now you're even older. Yes. And now you're even older. How about now? And every single person listening to this right now is screaming at their radio because they know the reference and you don't. <laughs> uh, it's adorable that you said radio. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's the 1920s, and we're here putting on our radio show for the people out there. That's pretty good. Thanks. I mean, I got to make it up from whatever weird reference I'm clearly missing. <sighs> I thought it was a Spaceballs thing. It's not a Spaceballs thing. You're a Spaceball. I'd love to be. Hail Scroob. <laughs> Chew your gum. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. Okay. Deeper cut than I went. So <laughs> you win the nerd battle. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. That is a backhanded compliment. Oh, no. I don't want that to open in music. I want it open in quick time. Uh, sure. We're going we're gonna to try something uh, that's probably going to be a disaster. Um, yeah. We should, try turning have... mic. we should try turning your mic down a little bit. <laughs> oh, is it still... You're coming in hot. Sorry. That's all right. You're just excited. I get it. Sometimes we're excited about things. I mean, not this, but other things. And so, you know, we'll do, we'll do those things. Um, while I was avoiding starting work this morning, I found an absolutely awesome YouTube video that talked about egg corns, not acorns, egg corns. Are you familiar with those as a concept? A corn made out of egg? Not quite. And you can go back up a scotch, a scotch, just a scotch. So acorn is actually kind of an eponymous term in the sense that it's named after the mistake that people made of hearing the word acorn, mishearing it, hearing it as egg corn, and then going, well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's shaped kind of like an egg and it is a corn, as in, you know, the original meaning of the word corn. So that's what they call it. I mean, it's pretty much any phrase or idiom or term that people have misheard and, and reinterpreted in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, Isn't and that just a malapropism? Nope, that's different. Malapropism is when you think you know the word, but you're actually wrong or you're using a word completely incorrectly. This is something along the lines of wet your appetite would be one where wet is wet. W H E T, but people will often spell it W E T because yeah, wet your appetite. You know, like I'm I'm generating saliva. Sorry for that image, and yes, I, I've wetted my appetite and now I'm ready to eat. So it's just that misinterpretation of of a common phrase, and this is something everybody has done at some point in their lives, whether they realize it or not. Nope, not me. I've always been perfect. Uh, mine was for all intents and purposes. And for a long time, I thought it was for all intensive purposes. Oh, now it's starting to come together. Okay. Intensive purposes. Like right, it's right, intense. Right. Like it made sense to me that that would be the phrase, not intense and purposes, but. And do you think that that happens because you don't like read things? I think part of it is it comes up in conversation as opposed to being read somewhere. And so you, but I mean, everybody knows that English is a completely logical and sensible language. <laughs> Christ. Oh, you win again. I just, I can't top that. No, you should probably do the thing. Hello, alleged human, and welcome to the Chaos Lever podcast. My name is Ned, and I'm definitely not a robot. As a not robot, I don't have fun in the usual sense. Rather, I've been programmed with various activities or tasks to keep me occupied and stimulated. These might include playing common, normal human games like Mancala, Naftol, or my personal favorite, Chaturanga. I had a lot of tickling, enigmatic sensations in my quartz hand, moving my Rafta and Ashva in concert, let me tell you. Ah, oh, the 8th century. Hmm. Anyway, with me is Chris, who is also here and made me say all of those things. 
<laughs> oh my God, that was beautiful pronunciation. I have no notes. <laughs> I did not even bother to look up whether some of those games were real. Oh, they're all real. And I don't want to know, though. I, I Honestly, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't pre-write that for you. What? Were you also avoiding work or writing <laughs> the Chaos Lever episode? And you're like, let's go research games from the 8th century. Look, I cannot be responsible for where inspiration takes me. <laughs> So this will tie back somehow to the topic of today? Nope. Excellent. That's my favorite kind of segue. <laughs> so. Oh, that was the segue. Sorry, that I was wasn't it, listening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. welcome. So. CISA says to federal agencies that they are tired of these monkey fighting security configuration aches on these Monday to Friday management planes. Okay, so well, st- work with me here. I'm working. I am not going to say that the only reason I wanted to use this topic was to shoe hin sh- shoe hin. <sighs> it's going to be a long one, kids. <laughs> Shoehorn in that immediately terrible play on words, but it did help a little bit. In fact, I even got an anonymous celebrity guest <sighs> to help get the people going. Woo! So wait, hold with, work with me here. Let me try this again. CISA says to federal agencies that. Tired of these monkey fighting security configuration aches on these Monday to Friday management planes. I didn't feel like there was a lot of spirit there. Did you? No, no. Like, it I think, felt very muted. Yeah. Possibly far away from the mic. Let's see if we can try that again. Okay. Tired of these monkey fighting security configuration aches on these Monday to Friday management planes. <laughs> there you go. That's more like it. That's the spirit. And that was totally legit. That was definitely a real human being that exists. And it was more than worth spending $10,000 of Ned's money. So I, I thanks can't for disagree. being a part of it. Completely anonymous celebrity guest person. Imagine what we could have done with a cameo. <laughs> Look, I don't have that kind of scratch, and neither do you. I checked your bank account. Fair. Anyway, moving on. Mm Mm-hmm. So, the CISA is mad. Oh. Now, CISA, for those not in the know, stands for Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Yeah, they said security twice. It's the government. Just work with us here. They are a government body that is empowered by the Department of Homeland Security to issue directives, recommendations, and best practices around IT security in the government space. So they issued a fascinating, informational, and most importantly, free maturity model around implementing zero trust. Hmm. Now you can download this for yourself, but I also will link to a Bright Talk presentation that goes over version 2.0 in the show notes. So this is all like helpful information, best practices, that kind of thing. Right. And And that's all fine and good and valuable. When we talk about zero trust, it's very hand wavy a lot of times, very marketing friendly, by which I mean, it can mean whatever they want it to mean. So I'm guessing this is less that. Right. Well, I mean, zero trust, it's important to remember that zero trust is not a technology. It's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. So what they actually also can do and what they did this past week, this shirt is terrible. I hate this collar. Um, That's what they did? That's a strange thing. (laughs) They came in and criticized my wardrobe. It was messed up. (laughs) CISA, stay out of my wardrobe. Stay out of my Seriously. Anyway, but what they actually also have the power to do is issue what is called a binding directive. Mm. A binding directive is an imperative, which means no questions asked. This is not a nice to have situation or a best practices that you should probably follow. When it's a binding directive, you as a government entity will do what is required of you and you will theoretically, do it on time. Okay. 
And that's what the CISA did last week. Okay. Binding Operational Directive 23-02 was named, quote, Mitigating the Risk from Internet Exposed Management Interfaces. Released on June 13th, 2023, it states that all federal agencies that have management ports open to the public internet will have 14 days after being notified to, how do I put this? Not have management ports open on the public internet. <laughs> okay. This is, I mean, it's targeted at network devices and it's every single one you can think of. Interfaces, exchanges, fexes, pixes, if those are still exist, it's the government, so probably. Probably, yeah. Um, but it also includes general infrastructure management ports like ILO or IDRAC. Now, I just like to back up for a second. You really shouldn't have any of those ports on the public Internet to begin with. While you are right. What do you suppose are the chances that that's the situation? Oh, I know people do. I'm just saying, like you saw the ILO port and you're like, Internet. ILO, they both begin with I. I'll put them together. Like, no. My password is one, two, three, four, five. There's the space ball reference. <laughs> Thank God we can move on. So while it sounds dramatic, because um, like I said, this came out on the 13th. Today is the 26th. Ironically, mm -hmm. or not ironically, that's 13 days. Okay. But it's not like they issued that and everybody had to have everything fixed today or tomorrow. What it means is the CISA is going to do scanning, notify agencies of individual instances. Mm -hmm. And when they get that instance, then the clock starts ticking. So you might say to yourself, self, how would CISA know that there are vulnerable management ports on the public internet? Hmm. Well, I would say to that anonymous internet person, and I'm not talking to myself, CISA has a whole section of their organization that does nothing but scan the internet for vulnerabilities. In fact, they have what is called a cyber hygiene program that any company can sign up for for free hmm. to get information on what is exposed to the internet. So I think they're going to be okay at the whole finding management ports that are online thing. Right. It's basically Nessus scans that they do. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that the cyber hygiene program works is it's once a month, but you have to assume that for internal targets, they're going to do it a little bit more aggressively. Yeah. And what's interesting is they probably know generally the public IP blocks that at least the governmental agencies are using so they can yeah. scan those public IP blocks more aggressively than you would the entire internet because that's like it's a lot of IP addresses it's kind of like how hackers continually scan the public IP addresses of AWS looking for anything listening on 3389 right and they find them super fast and constantly because no constantly. one ever learns no so there is one head scratching exception to this uh, binding directive. And that is that organization, organizations defined as national security systems mm -hmm. or quote, certain systems operated by the Department of Defense or the intelligence community are exempt. What? I'm a little mystified by that, but whatever. They're the professionals, right? Surely they don't need oversight. Ooh. Uh, mm. Um. Yeah. So. So, hello, NSA. Thanks for tuning in. How about the Phillies, in. huh? That was a big <laughs> win last night. Woo! Uh, I was I was uh, hanging with a Mets fan, and they were uh, sl slightly disappointed, but totally unsurprised. <laughs> so there's that. I like the part where a Mets fan got sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a day ending in Y. I will mention, so, the like, the DOD and other, like, NSA and whatever – the CISA just doesn't have a purview over those organizations. So right. they can't issue a binding directive against those specific organizations. They can make a recommendation, but they just don't have the authority to do it. So that's why they're exempted. Well, that's dumb. It is dumb. <laughs> anyway, the remediations that are required from this BOD are simple. 
you've got two options. Mm -hmm. Take it off the internet and make it only accessible from internal networks or enforce control to the interface through a policy enforcement that is separate from the interface itself. Hmm. Okay. Now, saying that out loud, it sounds like both of those things are the same thing. And functionally, they are. But remember, we're talking about modernization and we're talking about zero trust. Zero trust is a philosophy. This is the new way to do it. Okay. The goal here is simple. Management interfaces themselves should never be in a position to be trusted to do the authentication. They should never be on the public internet in any way, period. Something has to be in between. Now, in right. the first case, the old version using a private network basically means you're VPNing into a private network, you're mm -hmm. authenticating one time, then you're hitting the management interface and you're authenticating again. Right. That's probably the way that everybody is used to doing this. Right. Now, the second way is the modern way, air quotes. <laughs> I don't know why I did air quotes. It actually is the modern way. It kind of is. Um, yeah. I just like to do air quotes. Who doesn't? This is what happens when you put me on video. At some point, there might be jazz hands. I don't know. <gasps> Whoa. Spear fingers. <laughs> so. In the zero trust model, we start to talk about SASEs, SSEs, or whatever, and the breakdown of the idea of a true perimeter. Meaning there is not just you log into the VPN, then you're inside the network. Right. Because you've established everything is everywhere, man. Right. You've established your trust at this hard perimeter that you allegedly have around your estate. And now that's it. You can do whatever the heck you want once you're through that initial perimeter. And I think we all know that if an attacker can do whatever the hell they want once they've passed one gate, that's probably not a good security posture. Correct. And generally speaking, whether you do it the old way with a VPN or the new way with some type of a broker, it's going to be far, far more robust than having a management port on the internet. <laughs> it's not the best option, but it's definitely not the worst. Right. And I think that's why the CISA resorted to a BOD and this kind of relatively short time frame. The way that I read it, I mean, I don't ordinarily try to anthropomorphize government documents, but this one was sassy. Oh, it really said to me, look, enough is enough. <laughs> this should have been fixed years ago, but fine. Now we're paying attention. Fix it now. <laughs> wow. And, you know, it probably goes without saying, but the BOD also states that all newly added devices will also have to have the same protections. So not only fix it, stop doing it. Yes. Now, you might be saying to yourself, self, this is so typical of the government always a step or 10 behind, which I mean, fair. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce you to GovCloud. Oh, but also it's not like the public sector is any better at what should be considered basic security hygiene. Mm -hmm. Look around at like any security company. They all publish reports on a yearly basis about how poorly configured most of the internet is. I picked one at random a company called census who I had never heard of before. They put out their 2023 state of the internet report and quoted a number of 8,000 public facing devices that were misconfigured. That's one company doing one scan. Mm -hmm. Now they didn't publish the who those 8,000 IPs were for obviously obvious reasons, but I think it's safe to say that they don't all end with .gov. Yeah. And that's certainly been my experience out in the wide, wider world of consulting is going into anywhere and going, oh, God, you have that open to the Internet. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that's the, I mean, I think that's the number one thing about that job is you roll into a customer's site and look around. And if you can keep yourself from screaming, what are you people doing? <laughs> you're in good hands. Well, you you're probably doing, shouldn't be there. 
because right. they don't need a consultant. <laughs> I think I've, I've told this story before, but it bears repeating because it's funny. Uh, one of the very first consulting things I did was to go to a small mom and pop shop that was a customer of the consulting group I was with. And they needed someone to upgrade their small business server from 2003 to 2008. This was in 2012. Nice. Yeah. And so I did a little bit of homework on how the existing server was configured and immediately noticed that the uh, it had like two ports on it. One that was the internal network and the other one that was the external network. The external network was not hooked up through a firewall. It was connected directly to the public internet. It had a public IP address, had RDP enabled on it. And the password, well, let's just say that it was less than eight characters, had no capitals, and maybe two numbers in it. One, How one, they one, were still one, functioning one. is a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, so. Hmm. What really put the cherry on the top for me, because I, I have to mention this, is that the owner of the business didn't allow the people on the internal network to get to the internet because he thought it would be a security risk. Huh. Yeah. That's a choice. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was fun. I had, to, I had to explain in very short and simple words why what he was doing and what was set up by the previous consultant was awful. Completely insane in all possible ways. Yeah. And the, uh, the previous consultant was there for some reason. So that was fun too. <laughs> so Derek, let's talk <laughs> about your work. <laughs> this is going to be a closed door conversation and I'm not <laughs> offering you coffee. So that's all part a. Okay. Now on to part two. Mm-hmm. Part two is the follow-on question and answer document that the CISA links directly to from the BOD. Mm -hmm. It outlines a few definitions, some clarifications, most of which is legalese that we don't need to get into. It states that the BOD does apply to contractors, federal civilian agencies, and satellite locations. Mm. It also applies to IAS and PAS resources because some of those have management ports of a kind. Mm -hmm. These probably shouldn't surprise anybody. Just like we're, we're setting the guidelines, right? But you know what else they mention that it applies to? Serial consoles that are made online available via a console server. Yep. <clears throat> That's a thing. What are we, what are we doing here? Just what are we doing? <laughs> Why is that online? <laughs> Serial consoles are historically, what's the word? Unsecurable. Com yeah, completely insecure. If you they have. They looked at Telnet and were like, let's find a way to make this easier. <laughs> as soon as you connect, it just dumps all the passwords out to you. It's fine. Se Serial consoles should not be plugged into anything unless you're actually in the room doing work. And even then, it's a 50-50. Yeah. It's 2023, kids. Can we just, can we just not? Ugh. Anyway. Okay. The other thing that they highlight is a number of best practices. Now, at the top of the BOD, it states that, quote, within two years following the issuance of this directive, CISA will review and update the directive as needed. Dot, dot, dot. And like, what does that say to you? They're not done. <sighs> right. More <laughs> is coming. And I'm going to guess that the within in that previous sentence doesn't mean 730 days. Count double. The so number. what do we think is coming? Well, this ties us back to where we started, which is zero trust. Mm -hmm. And why do I say that? Well, let me quote one of the Q and A's. Question, what concepts of zero trust is CISA looking for? Answer, CISA strongly encourages users and administrators to review documentation provided regarding zero trust. All these things and the zero trust 
maturity model. Some successful elements to a zero trust environment contain, but are not limited to MFA, asset management and identification, isolation of critical workloads and strong access policies, encryption of data in transit. These elements should not be considered a finite list, unquote. <laughs> I told you, sassy. Yeah. And that's not S-A-S-E. That's the regular S-A-S-S-Y. Why not both, honestly? <laughs> but yeah, it's, they're putting a little, little, little spin on that. They're, they are not content with the status quo, and they are uh, trying to let everyone know in the most governmental way possible. So, I mean, from that list, it's sad to me that MFA even needs to be called out, but clearly it does. Yeah. It would probably be harder for a state of the internet kind of survey to get determinations about how prevalent MFA is. Oh, actually, no, that's a lie, <laughs> isn't it? Um, there's plenty. My favorite, in 2021, when Google automatically enrolled 150 million of their users in MFA, it saw a 50% decline in accounts being compromised. Nice. This is no longer a question. MFA is better. Do yes. it and stop whining about it. I, what I've noticed is that lots of SaaS services have just started forcing it by default. They don't right. even ask you. It's just no, as part of the enrollment process, or even if you already have an existing account, you're just going to get pushed to enable MFA. I think GitHub rolled that out last year, or they're in the process of forcing every user on GitHub to enable MFA. And they should, <laughs> as should basically other every other SaaS service. Basically everybody, right? Yes. <laughs> so in January of this year, in some good news, Okta reported that their logins saw two thirds of regular users using MFA, along with 90% of administrators, which is a much higher percentage than we've had in the past. Now, to be fair, this is only companies and users that use Okta, mm -hmm. which might be a little bit of self-selection, but it's late and I'm tired. So I'm taking the win. Fair enough. Now, finally, it seems that asset management is of particular importance to CISA, as that actually got a second shout out in the Q&A section. Now, I hate doing all of this quoting because, A, it feels like I'm being lazy, which I'm totally not. <laughs> um, I feel like summarizing doesn't do it justice. So, and I quote, CISA expects that agencies have processes in place to identify and inventory all network management interfaces as part of a comprehensive asset management policy and strategy, unquote. Expects. SAS. It's if you don't, you're letting us down. We're not mad. We're, <laughs> We're just, just disappointed. disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong. But this seriously reads to me like when my mother would say, I expect you to have your homework done before dinner. Yes, it is very parental in, <laughs> I'm not sure a, a, a useful way, but they have the authority to, to enforce it. So I guess it doesn't matter. Right. And frankly, it's not like this is a bad idea. This is simultaneously one of the things about security that is the most essential and also the most boring. Mm -hmm. Nobody loves ITAM. No. Nobody. Even ServiceNow is like, ugh. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> That's what they sound like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the good old days when even naming conventions were considered too bougie for data center administrators. I also remember servers running for like 1500 days, not because we were proud of its configuration and stability, but because we literally couldn't find it. <laughs> we were afraid to reboot because we were pretty sure that system was important, but where the hell is it? Yep. And that's only one side of the coin. I mean, it's the under, other... it's under Bob's desk. We know it's under well, Bob's desk. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you this, but one of the times that we lost a server, and I mean physically lost the server, um, it was because it was drywalled into a false wall in between two rooms. <laughs> That's great. 
It was called Picasso, and I think that that is appropriate because that's a fucking work of art. <laughs> no notes. Beautiful. <laughs> So that's only one side of the coin. At least in that case, we knew a system existed. Mm -hmm. The other and more pernicious side is one where you set up a system, test something for like a day or a week or whatever, forget about that system, and then just leave it running forever. Mm -hmm. And that, I'm pretty sure, is the risk that CISA wants people to take more seriously. Because if you don't know that it's there the chances are you're not patching it. Yeah. And especially and if you're leveraging a cloud service, it's very easy to spin up some resources and then completely forget about them. Right. Very easy, tragically common, and super lucrative for the AWSs of the world. <laughs> They're not mad. <laughs> so yeah, that's about it. I mean, the document itself is actually not that long, but it talks a lot about what to me feels like table stakes for IT security. Right. Thoughts? I mean, I, I am not surprised that they have to make this recommendation. I'm glad that they're going to enforce it. And you mentioned it's not just the government agency, agencies themselves, but also consultants, contractors, civilian agencies, et cetera, that need to start doing this security. And anybody, that to me says anybody who wants to work with one of these government agencies is going to have to enforce this. So this has trickle down effects far beyond the initial scope of just government agencies. Right. I definitely think that there's going to be a follow on to this, like I alluded to before, mm -hmm. um, not just in the sense of we expect you to do X, Y, and Z, but also we expect you to audit it and prove it is probably coming next. Right. I'm just thinking about how disruptive this is going to be for, you know, uh, Sally Sue, the network administrator who's used to being able to just like console into all of the switches that are in the offsite data center. And suddenly she's like, but I, I can't just connect to the console server, you know, directly. No, you can't, Sally. <laughs> you know it. I know it. Ned's dog knows it. I'm looking at her right now and she's like, uh-huh. Yeah. She's just sitting there going, secure access service edge. <laughs> What's so hard about that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do walkies. <laughs> secure walkies. Obviously. Obviously. Lightning round? Lightning round. All right. Advertising company Google fails to Bing irony. Bing's still not a verb, is it? They're trying to make it one, and it's really awkward for everyone. Yay. Microsoft is no stranger to anti-competitive lawsuits and neither is advertising company Google. But this one might be a first. ACG has filed an official complaint with the US FTC over what they say are anti-competitive practices by the admittedly much bigger cloud provider, Microsoft. At the heart of the complaint is an alleged practice of quote, overly complex agreements that seek to lock in clients to their ecosystems, end quote. To which I say, yes, and? It's no secret that Microsoft and all the other cloud providers design their services and licensing in such a way as to provide an advantage to customers who practice, let's call it cloud monogamy. <laughs> One such example is Windows licensing in Azure versus Google Cloud or AWS. Customers with existing Windows licenses can use that license on Azure workloads, but not on EC2 or Google Compute instances, giving Microsoft a cost advantage. Now, advertising company Google isn't wrong that it's unfair, but ACG isn't exactly known for their own fair dealing. They are currently facing an antitrust lawsuit over exclusionary agreements that is set to go to trial in September. Maybe the simple answer is that all of these companies should be investigated for antitrust by the FTC. Oh, and don't forget about Oracle. Is that like forgetting about Dre? Yeah, yeah, we don't want him to forget about Larry. Ah, oh, this is just rife with references that you don't get. I know they forgot about Dre. Oregon finally gives in and legalizes pumping your own gas. 
<laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I know. This one's not actually technology related unless you consider the highly complex task of getting out of your car, pushing a button, then pulling a handle in order to fill a gas tank as technological. But for certain hosts of this show who grew up in New Jersey and are still annoyed that this is a thing, it's kind of a big deal. Mm. Ever since 1951, Oregon has not permitted regular people to pump their own gas except in very narrow circumstances. Up until recently, they've only been peers with the Garden State in this respect. The law was weird, but vendors could actually be fined $500 for every customer who had the audacity to be self-reliant. But this past week, the Oregon legislature made it legal to handle this daunting task yourself statewide and with no restrictions. Your move, tomato state. So, my wife is from New Jersey, and she drives to a gas station that is farther because they pump your gas for you. <laughs> you can take the girl out of Jersey, but you can't take Jersey out of the girl. Sometimes we can have nice things. Yay! Intel has announced that the Aurora supercomputer installation is complete. The massive computing cluster is a collaboration between Intel, HPE, and the Department of Energy. Composed of 10,246 compute blades containing 63,744 Intel data center GPUs and 21,248 Xeon Max processors. Whew, that's a lot. At the moment, this is the largest GPU cluster in the world. The theoretical peak performance of the system is two exaflops. The current record on the top 500 is the Frontier system, an HPE Cray EX system hitting a single lonely exaflop. It's pathetic, really. Aurora is now going into the acceptance testing phase where the system will be stress tested to identify bugs before full blown workloads are pushed. What type of workloads? At the moment, they are planning to run large open source generative AI models for science because what the hell else would they run? Based on Moore's law, we should expect a similar amount of compute power to be available on our phones in about a decade. Unfortunately, Siri will, st Siri will still be ducking terrible. I see what you did there. Yeah, you do. SoftBank just can't stop never stopping. Or wait, no, I mean losing money. <laughs> <sighs> another day, another ridiculous investment by SoftBank that completely fell apart. IRL, which is really their name, is a messaging startup that was backed by the bank that nobody should be banking on. IRL has since folded. Why did it fold? Well, it turns out that just like literally all of social media, 95% of its users were bots. IRL indeed. It is amazing to me that this kind of thing continues to surprise people. I mean, just look at Twitter. Do I have to? There are legit businesses out there that do nothing but sell pretend people to follow you so that your follow number goes up. Mm -hmm. And that's just the legit ones. Do people seriously think that 140 million people give a shit what Elon Musk has to say? Spoiler alert, they do not. That's a pretend number. It should also not be a super surprise, considering that the SoftBank fund has lost an amazing $32 billion in the past year. And that CEO Masayoshi Son has admitted that he's been taking advice from where else? ChatGPT. Mm. What's the worst that could happen? Some might ask. Well, this. Is it a massive money laundering scheme? Let's ask ChatGPT. <laughs> oh. DuckDuckGo developers remember Windows is still a thing. <sighs> Look. I know all the hip developers out there are plugging away on their trusty MacBook Pros, but last I checked, Windows is still the most popular desktop operating system out there, for better or for worse, which is why I'm always gobsmacked when these things are released 
for Mac OS first and only. Now, stepping off my soapbox for a moment, nine months after the release of a DuckDuckGo browser for Mac comes a formal beta release for Windows users. Of significant note is that the DuckDuckGo browser is not simply using a reskinned version of Chromium, a la Edge. Instead, the team at DDG built a new app that uses the WebView 2 API and Blink rendering engine, a combination that they claim is faster than Chrome and blocks some of the tracking inherent in Windows apps by going so far as to block crash reports from being sent to Microsoft. There is still a lot of work left to do on the browser, including better extension support and syncing across devices. But if you're looking for a privacy-focused browser on Windows, you could do a lot worse. And by a lot worse, I mean Chrome. Zing. Four nanometer process created for the new Snapdragon processor, confounding physics just because. Qualcomm has announced a new lower end processor for cell phones, IoT devices, and the like, named the Snapdragon 4 Generation 2. What's interesting is that they have announced that this model is decreasing the size from six to four nanometers, which is bonkers. Mm. The announced features of the chip include the usual faster functioning, better battery life, lower heat, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. What is not discussed is how in the world Qualcomm is actually able to do this because five nanometers has always been supposed to be the theoretical physical limit of transistor size. Anything smaller and you run the risk of quantum tunneling, which basically means that electrons just do whatever <laughs> and to hell with your boring human concept of ones and zeros. So this is still a much smaller processor in general than a standard CPU. It's going to be interesting to see how CPU designs progress as we head towards a still theoretical two nanometer build by as soon as next year. Uh, I don't get it, Ned. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, we'll have we'll find somebody else to explain it to us. But I, we need we need a processor adult. <laughs> we do. Oh, in the meantime. Thanks for listening or something. I guess you found it worthwhile enough if you made it all the way to the end. So congratulations to you, friend. You accomplished something today. Now you can go hand gliding in the greater Salt Lake City area with your best friend, Herman, and his pet echidna, Ralph. You've earned it. You can find me or Chris on Twitter at Ned1313 and at Hainer80, respectively, or follow the show at Chaos underscore Lever. That's the kind of thing you're into. Or just, you know, go over to LinkedIn because that's where I am now. Um, show notes are available at chaoslever.com. If you like reading things, which you shouldn't, podcasts continue their inevitable march to be better in every conceivable way. We'll be back next week to see what fresh hell is upon us. Ta-ta for now. What the hell is hand gliding? What do you mean? You said hand. It's I, hand gliding. No, hand gliding. We're just going to glide with our hands out the window, you know? It's <laughs> know and you know it, sir. <laughs> Sometimes I'm rushing and I just type things. So you shush. You oh, shush. And Google didn't autocorrect me. So that's that's really more Google's problem than it's mine. Don't you think? Is it ironic? No. Oh.